this morning, continuing on in the book of Ruth. It looks like it's not working and it's not reading. Don't you love technology? <laughs> oh, keynote has to be open, it says. So it's open. It's on there. Okay. Wow. Looks like you may have to run it from the back then. Um, because it's not, it's not giving me the signal. <laughs> okay. Well, we will muscle through it, and when we get to the passages that uh, we're supposed to read, I'll trust that uh, Jenna's ability uh, is uh, bar none, is par excellence. She is great back there, so she'll be able to follow pretty well. So last week... I mentioned how these books, Book of Ruth, they were meant to be read aloud so that the hearers would be caught up in the wonder of God's sovereignty in all of life's events. So walking through these seasons of faith, we've seen winter first in chapter 1 when pleasantness gives way to bitterness bitterness. And then we saw spring in chapter 2, didn't we, where winter thaw, uh, thaws, and it gives us the promise of new life to come. And this morning, we're looking at the life that erupts in summer. Last week, we watched as Ruth and Naomi awoke to the possibility that Boaz maybe could be a kind of savior, savior to them personally and for Elimelech's entire family line as a kinsman redeemer. We saw him prefiguring Jesus because just as he provided for Ruth in his field, so Jesus invites us to live in the field of his provision, protection, and preservation. We learned that just as with Ruth, such abundant love and mercy from God is undeserved, and it's what motivates us to love sacrificially, to show mercy and to bless abundantly, even when people don't deserve it, even when we don't deserve it, right? After all, we love because he first loved us, right? So Ruth and Naomi, they saw the light of hope despite their dire circumstance. We saw it for ourselves today uh, uh, we, just as we did then. Today, we're going to see it even more. We're going to see uh, this passage. We're going to separate three truths that we can also apply to ourselves as we learn from Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. And I think if you've been here up to this time, you're invested now in this unfolding saga of what's going on, this drama of Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz, and you're wondering, what's going to happen? Well, I mean, I guess if you've read the book already, you know what's going to happen, and, and so you're kind of like someone who's re-watching one of your favorite movies uh, for the third or fourth time. You know what's coming, and you're getting wrapped up in the drama of it all. And how could we not be wrapped up in it, right? We watched Ruth move from an outsider to an insider. She moved from other to one of us. And that's a great picture. She's no longer outside, even though she's still a Moabite. She's integrated into the people of Israel. Look at the language of 2.20 and 3.2 on this next slide. We saw Last week in chapter 2, he is one of our closest relatives. And now in Ruth chapter 3, verse 2, we're going to see, Now is not Boaz our kinsman? Our. Ruth is included. She's one of our own. And we can tell she sees herself that way in today's text. So I want you to just listen as I read the entire chapter in the NASB. Uh, of course, you can follow along or even just close your eyes and picture it. But don't go to sleep, okay? Listen. Take in the story. Don't miss the drama of this scene. Starting in verse 1, then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? 
Now is not Boaz our kinsman with whose maids you were? Behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. Wash yourself therefore and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. It shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies and you shall go and uncover his feet. Uncover his feet and lie down. Then he will tell you what you shall do. She said to her, all that you say I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And she came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. It happened in the middle of the night. Did you notice that? It kind of skips. It happened in the middle of the night. There's no hanky-panky going on there. It happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled, and he bent forward. And behold, a woman was lying at his feet. You can kind of picture him rubbing the sleep out of his eyes, right? He said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maid. I am Ruth, your maid. Right there, if you notice from chapter 2, that's a different word. In chapter 2, she said, I'm your maidservant. Now, she's made. The change of those uh, two terms, it points out that she's seeing herself not as an outsider, but as one with Israel. I am Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid. For you are a close relative. Then he said, May you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than the first by not going after young men, whether poor or rich. Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you ask. For all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. Now it is true, I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Remain this night, and when morning comes, if he will redeem you, good, let him redeem you. But if he does not wish to redeem you, then I will redeem you as the Lord lives. That's an oath in the Hebrew culture. Lie down until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning and rose before one could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. That's going to become important. Why? Later. Again, he said, give me the cloak that is on you and hold it. So she held it and he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, how did it go, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done for her. She said, these six measures of barley he gave to me. For he said, do not go to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then she said, wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest until he has settled it today. Well, I don't know if this is a God thing or not. I hope you caught uh, the things going on in this passage. We're going to talk about them more. Uh, My slide thing started working. So if you want to, I can control it from here now. So don't you love technology? (laughs) So now Naomi instructed Ruth in a decent proposal. Nothing indecent going on here. And yet, the hearer would have immediately seen in their mind's eye, wait, wait a second, whoa, I know where the Moabites came from. And they would start to think. See, in Genesis 19, verses 30 through 38, we see that the Moabites came from Lot's drunken union with his eldest daughter. And here we see a scene that would have been similar to them in that regard. But where Genesis 19 involved drunkenness and sexual shame, Ruth 3 was a picture of merriment and purity. Oh, but it's full of moxie, isn't it? You know, that you've got some nerve kind of idea. What what does Naomi tell Ruth to do? Uncover his feet. Whew. Did you just get the chill of the romance? Do you see it building? You get all Twitter-pated thinking about it? 
Yeah, um, no, I don't see that. I know some of you are probably thinking, um, we're talking about feet here, okay? Romance is in a galaxy far, far away from this scene. Get off my feet, buddy. We're probably thinking that, but here, it's actually a romantic gesture. In this case, it's showing vulnerability. I mean, she's asking for redemption. Spread your covering, she says. She's not just asking him to take the nip out of the air, but the nip that can accumulate in a person's soul when they have little hope that things are going to improve. They don't know where things are going. He's her kinsman. Redeem me, she's saying. This took guts because Ruth was acting in a way typically reserved for prostitutes, except she didn't dress like prostitutes or act like a common prostitute. She was speaking Israel's language, the cultural language of redemption. So Ruth risks a bruised body and a broken spirit. If Boaz actually turns out to not be the man of character than they, that they thought he was, Asking for his covering, she was risking something there. But Boaz was a good man. And in this passage, we see that he protected her virtue and her reputation, didn't he? He he wanted her to rest that night. And he wanted to avoid anyone thinking that something disreputable might have been going on there. He protected the honor she'd gained in town because in this act She wasn't doing anything wrong, but she had moxie to do that, didn't she? Think about the disparity between these two people. A woman proposes to a man, essentially, and in this culture, totally unheard of. She was a Moabite proposing to an Israelite, a beggar to a landowner, one with nothing reaches out to the one who had everything. And what was the result? He blessed her. He called her kind, a woman of excellence. I'll redeem. But it wasn't just with words. He measured out six measures of barley and blessed Ruth and Naomi both. He he maintains his history of lavish generosity from chapter 2. And with the gift, he demonstrates a kind of good faith. Now, there could be three things going on here. One, he knows his role as a kinsman redeemer, even if he's not the only one. And he's committed to step up to the plate and figure out a solution for Ruth so that she's cared for, whether it's by him or by the other kinsman redeemer. Second, he appreciates Naomi's initiative, possibly because she encouraged the end to Ruth's mourning her husband's death, essentially giving Boaz the message, the green light, that she's now available. And third, a bride price. Now, now some people can read passages like these and consider that, well, a bride price means that you're like purchasing the woman, but that's not actually the case. It's more of a good faith commitment to her. It's kind of like when you buy a house and you have to make a good faith payment. It's because you are fully intending to purchase this house. So you're not so much purchasing the woman so much as you're saying to that woman's family, I am committing to care for this person, and this is what I'm doing. I'm putting my money where my mouth is, as the saying may go. So, if that's what's going on here, it's the promise of pursuit to make Ruth his wife, if at all possible, and if needed. And considering how Naomi said that the Lord had brought her back empty-handed in chapter 1, verse 21, now in 317, Boaz said, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Do you see what the Spirit of God is doing in telling us this story, this change of circumstances? Boaz blessed them in full measure. The Spirit of God has directed events that would have stirred the hearts of the Israelites to see the provision and the faithfulness 
of God. He's preserving these women and their family line. Well, so that's all well and good, but how do we apply these things to us today, these three truths? Well, symbolically, we are Ruth and God is Boaz. If God has done this for, for them, he can do it for us as well. We have nothing to come to God with, and God has everything. And yet all of Scripture paints an audacious picture of how to translate that nothing, our sin and the punishment that we deserve, into not just good enough, but the very righteousness of God himself. Take your nothing to God, give it freely, and what is he, what is he gonna do in response? Have you seen God's goodness? Do you know God's character? Can we trust him, you may ask? Yes, yes, we can trust him to be perfectly just and to, to punish us in our sin. We deserve it. But we can also trust his promise to relent of that judgment if we turn from sin to trust in him through Jesus. He is our covering, our kinsman redeemer. And through Christ, we are no longer outside. We're no longer outside. Do you see it, church? 1 Peter 2.10 says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is straight out of Hosea 1.10, where it was said to them, you are not my people. They will be called children of the living God. You want to see the power of God to transform and redeem? Go home and read Hosea this week, all 14 chapters in one sitting, if you can uh, handle it, and come tell me that God hasn't graciously offered us life in him if we trust him. But, but David, what about all the pain in the world? That's a really good question. Can a child damaged by harsh parents learn to receive love again? Can a woman or a man broken by divorce find redemption and healing? Can parents who lose a child chance the possible pain and try again? Can sinners, enemies of God through wicked works, be forgiven? Yes, 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 people of God. Yes, seekers of God. Look at what it says in Romans 5, 10 through 11. If while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, we shall be saved by his life. And we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a call to joy. That means we rejoice. Church, do you know what the character of God means to you who are in him? In Colossians 1, 19 through 23, it says, It was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. That means you and I are covered in Christ. We're not just no longer outside. We're no longer just in the family. We are covered in Christ. God beckons us so we come to him but with nothing to offer and yet we get everything. But how do we know? I mean, how do you really know? How do you know we won't just get rejected again like so many times in our lives? Can we trust in the promise of God? Yes, you can. 
He has given us Jesus the Christ who died for us. And Jesus has given the Holy Spirit as a seal of the promise till the day of full redemption. Check out those passages that I've given you. The Spirit teaches us all things. He guides us into all truth. He reminds us of Christ's teachings. We are being made perfect through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit in us. That is what I call being blessed in full measure. Blessed in full measure. That is the transformative reality that we bear in Christ. But let's be honest. I mean, sometimes life is hard. Sometimes the reality of who we are in Christ isn't as real to us as our circumstances. So we have to ask God to remind me who I am just like Jason Gray does in this video. As we talk this Harvest Sunday, we know that when you plant something, you expect a crop to grow. You know, our circumstances are real, but they can also cloud the reality of those in Christ and even keep people from turning to Christ in the first place. They can choke us out, you know, sometimes like this next picture. It just cracks me up. <laughs> sometimes our situations, sometimes our circumstances can choke us out and so the seed doesn't bear fruit and it can be painful. It's not this cute like with a cat, when it happens to us. Situations in our lives can define who we are. We take these labels on ourselves, or sometimes they're given to us by others. And, well, we wind up living defeated lives rather than recognizing who we are in Christ and the transformation that he has given us. And so it takes Christ coming along behind us, and he changes us. He gives us a new label. He reminds us that this label that you've been given, this label that you've taken upon yourself, it's not who you are in Christ. Your reality has been changed fundamentally. And so we try to take these messages and it's, it's hard. Sometimes we still can't live by it. We just know that this is who I am. And so we hold this out to the world, even though this is our reality in Christ. The problem is when we're holding our reality out and we're showing people this reality out here, the problem is, well, we can still see, uh-oh, this is my reality in Christ, but I can still see the label that I've been given. I mean, we look at it, we know it's not right. I mean, it's upside down. We just know that it's not the case anymore. And so the justification that we've been given in Christ, that we are redeemed, we are beloved, we are forgiven in Christ that reality is given to us. It is ours when Christ is Lord in our lives. But the problem is, as we hold it out to people, seeing that there's something more than just that justification. Scripture calls it sanctification. It is the lifelong process of taking this reality of who we are in Christ and bringing it so close to the chest that all that we can see now is the truth such that if any kind of uh, sin or uh, failing or lie would try to come in and get in the way, we reject it out of hand because Christ is better. Church, Christ is better this is our reality in Christ. So what do you do with that? There are a number of people here. You can go ahead and place them down. 
in your places right here. This reality of who you are in Christ, it is something that we have to remind ourselves of daily, sometimes hourly. And so what does that mean for you right now? This is the place where we stand and we make a decision where we're at. The changes that God takes us through may hit you in a different place. Maybe for you, you're in the place where uh, you're still on the outside and you need to trade that outside perspective for coming inside the family of God under the grace, the banner of Christ. Maybe, maybe you've been in that family uh, and so you just need to be taking some steps, walking in faith in Christ. What does that look like? Taking more steps uh, for you. Maybe you've been taking the steps, but for you, you're still living shackled by a label. It doesn't define who you are anymore. Maybe it's time for you to trust the Lord who has changed your label and you need some prayer. As the worship team comes forward, this is our song of invitation. It's a time and an opportunity for you to do heart work with God. Whatever you're needing right now in this place, I pray that you will respond as we sing this next song. Will you go ahead and stand with me?